So, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to uh, to join me. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about uh, how we can start looking at deploying cloud infrastructure using a developer-centric approach. So just kind of briefly about me, and I think it will hopefully set some context around um, why I'm particularly interested in this topic. So I'm a principal platform architect at a company called Aura. We're a retail crime intelligence platform. We're headquartered in New Zealand, uh, but we have offices in Australia, uh, the US, and recently now in the UK as well. Our engineering team is based all in New Zealand, though. And um, you know, if you if you're interested in potentially you know, moving to New Zealand, I'm always happy to have a chat and give you some give you some tips on on my my experience. Uh, key thing really is that although I'm uh, platform architect now, so I do a lot of cloud, cloud infrastructure and cloud architecture stuff. My background's in software development, and that's kind of what led me down this path, if you like. I focus on modern cloud architecture and DevOps. Um, I've got I've got Twitch open, and I'll try and keep an eye on the Twitch stream in terms of questions, um, and I'll try and take them as we go along, but but also I'll, I'll try and stick around at the end for a little bit just to make sure. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, my Twitter handles on that page there, and then also my LinkedIn. If, um, and both places, you're welcome to send me private messages if you want to talk about anything. So in terms of what we want to talk about today, um, really, I'm going to cover the common ways that we uh, provision cloud infrastructure, and we'll talk about some of the limitations. And then really, I want to introduce this tool called Pulumi, which has been gaining a lot of traction in recent years. So when we think about cloud infrastructure, the first place that most of us um, turn to is, is the portals. The, these cloud providers all generally have a portal of some kind, and this portal allows you to start experimenting and provisioning your cloud resources. And this can be a great way of getting started. There's a number of real benefits of, of cloud uh, portals, key one being discoverability. But you don't know what's available unless you can see it. You know, there's, there's a page, it gives you an introduction, explains what it does. And that's really helpful. Uh, when you want to provision a resource, those portals generally give you some kind of wizard. They'll give you options and drop downs, and they'll let you, they'll guide you through creating one of these resources. And again, that's really helpful for getting started. Um, they can validate your inputs. So you they make sure that you're entering the correct values. And sometimes the resources will end up having some kind of a fully qualified domain name, and therefore there are certain characters you can't have. And these portals will generally validate that for you when you're provisioning them. Now, of course, there are drawbacks to this kind of approach, so it's great to get started. But when you want to do things kind of repeatedly and, and often, it can be really difficult to do that consistently. But the human being, and I'm terrible at this in particular, will not be consistent. Uh, I, I tend to name things differently every time I come back to do something. And, and that can be quite, quite frustrating for others who have to deal with your resources. Now, of course, some of the options that you want, they could be buried in kind of deep submenus. So when you're first exploring, they can be really helpful. But if you know exactly where it is, the fact that you've got to click through, you know, two or three screens to get to it can be can be quite frustrating. Um, and of course, as we as we kind of move forwards, generally speaking, you're going to want to provision lots of resources. And then that's where the human clicking and clicking and pointing and stuff on the screen is really not scalable. And in particular, if you're trying to do stuff in parallel. Um, and probably not super, not, not a huge problem, but you as a human have to kind of generally resolve the dependencies. So if you're provisioning a bunch of resources, you will generally need to ensure that you provision them in the order that you might need values from one to the other. So you might need a storage account for another resource. You need to make sure the storage account's created first. Um, you know, sometimes you get the option to create it, but sometimes you have to create that first. So it's up to you to resolve the, that dependency graph, if you like. And because of these kinds of challenges, this concept of infrastructure as code came about. So I'm not going to read that definition as it is there on the screen, but essentially what it says is you have machine readable definition files and they will they will help you define what you want to create. Um, and on that kind of um, theme, this is where most of the cloud providers have their own systems for doing this. So Azure's Resource Manager, AWS CloudFormation, Google has Deployment Manager, and almost every other cloud or service provider generally has their own concept of doing this. I'm going to focus mostly on Azure because it's the platform I know the most, and I'm going to talk mostly around ARM, and I know BICEP is a thing, and then we'll touch on BICEP towards the end. 
but the first part of this, we will focus on ARM and, and some of the ARM issues. So here's an ARM template, and uh, this ARM template's for creating a, um, a storage account, it's just a single resource. And the first thing you notice is that's a lot of that's a lot of text, and it looks like it looks like JSON, um, but that's quite a lot of it's quite verbose for creating a, a single storage account. And if we zoom in a little bit, this is really the bit of the sorry, this is a bit of the template where things start looking a bit weird. So it looked like JSON initially, but then we're starting to see these things that look like, you know, we've got we've got parentheses in here, we've got what looks like functions. And this is really the first place where these uh, this concept of a of a template file starts to look a bit weird. Um, and essentially what's going on here is we're starting to have to create some kind of programming constructs because we need to be able to you know, either evaluate variables at a point in time or we, maybe we need to concatenate things. And we'll have a look at some of these as we go along. Um, so what started off as, you know, looked like essentially markup is now starting to look like there's something a bit specific and a bit bespoke, to be honest with you. And that's that's one of the challenges. But now if we have this template, the nice thing with the template is, of course, we can, um, the template's essentially self-describing. We can just uh, take the Azure CLI in this case and we can run that template and we can get those resources provision. And now what we've got is the ability to kind of do this consistently because everything's in that template. Um, if somebody else needs to provision the same resources, they can run the same command. And generally speaking, they should get the same result. So that, that concept now of having that template, it can be automated now. You can have a build system that runs that template for you. And that's great. You know, that's a step forwards in terms of managing these things versus doing it in the portal. Those templates generally are declarative. They will show you, you will describe the end state that you want your system to be in. And it's up to the cloud provider to essentially you know, follow those instructions, if you like. And I kind of said it. Because it's a template and it's all it's all in that self-describing the template. If you want to provision lots of storage accounts, you can run that template lots of times with different names, and it's really easy. <clears throat> with these templates, you often are referencing other bits of the template, and because of that, the system underlying this this kind of templating um, approach can resolve. Generally speaking, can resolve dependencies, so it will know it needs to create a storage account first because you've referenced the name of the storage account later on. So what are the challenges? Well, the first one really is it's it's very verbose. Um, certainly in the context of Azure ARM templates, very verbose. Um, where I, I start having a challenge with this is it's domain specific. So now that syntax we use in ARM templates is, is really specific to ARM. There's no standard, um, that's not a recognizable standard or you know, a language specification. It's custom to Azure ARM templates. If you're working with other cloud providers, you need to learn their version of that, and you know, each of them have that. Um, and maybe not so important, but the the underlying code behind the ARM engine is all closed source, and you know sometimes that might be an issue if we're running into problems and we don't necessarily know what's going on. Because of the some of these challenges, um, other tools have kind of come into this space, and, and a popular one is Terraform. So Terraform is a tool by a company called HashiCorp, and they use their own markup language called HCL. The key difference with say ARM or CloudFormation and Terraform is Terraform is designed to target lots of platforms and lots of cloud providers. Um, it's also open source and it's written in Go, Go's the kind of systems language of choice for a while. I think Rust has kind of taken over now. So key thing here is now you're using hopefully a consistent um, kind of domain specific language for lots of platforms you're targeting. Um, so in the past, I was skeptical about using something like Terraform if I was only using, you know, Azure Resource Manager. Um, although I think you know there are still some reasons why you could you would consider using Terraform or would have considered using Terraform. So let's look at the same example, uh, or slightly extended example actually, of creating a resource group and a storage account. And the first thing is you can see it's it's a lot terser. There's there's no one no one near as much code on the screen. Um, and here we we start to see stuff that you know I particularly as a developer I'm reasonably comfortable with this this concept of of dotting into properties of a of an object you know and here we can see we're we're taking the resource group um, and we we're, we're dotting into it and taking out properties like the name and the location. Um, 
So some of the challenges with this is, of course, this is now a special language that is used only by Terraform. Or I think that's still the case. There are others who are using HCL as a kind of inspiration, but essentially it's a, it's a, it's a language only used by Terraform. One of the big issues with Terraform is um, it has this provider model, which means that <clears throat> either the cloud provider, HashiCorp, or the industry, or the community rather, has to build a provider for a, uh, a new a new feature or a new resource that a cloud provider may release. And there can be a delay between that happening. So if, if Azure releases a new feature, um, then you may not have that available in Terraform for you know, possibly days, weeks, months, years, maybe never. Maybe it's a feature that's not that popular. You would have to go and create it yourself. At least you have the option to do that, but, but you know, hey. <clears throat> so you have this lag, this problem of, of uh, it taking a while before that feature is available. Now, as Terraform has gained a lot of you know, traction, you're finding cloud providers are generally trying to work with HashiCorp to build a provider so it's available on day one sometimes. Um, but but I'd suggest that's probably not not as common as as you know certainly as I'd like. Uh, Terraform also has this concept of state and managing state can be a bit of a challenge. It, it really depends on how you how you approach using Terraform. But if you decide to do it all yourself, then you need to manage state yourself. And you know if you're not careful, secrets can kind of leak into state as well, and and that can be a challenge. Um, again, that's maybe not a significant issue for me. The biggest one here is really the lagging behind and also the special language. So far, we've looked at really, really simple example. It's basically just a single storage account. Um, in reality, when we do a cloud infrastructure in, in any kind of real world, we have more complex requirements. We have conditional logic. This is you know, very common. So um, we, <clears throat> so Aura, we run a, a large SaaS based, um, so, sorry, PaaS based platform. And we geo-replicate our databases, like I'm sure my, you know, many of you would do. But we don't want to run geo-replication in our kind of dev test environment. So it, it, it's not really necessary. So we want conditional logic that says if it's in dev test, then don't, don't geo-replicate. If it's in prod, geo-replicate. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you need to run a loop. You may need to provision um, a set of resources based on a a, you know, some kind of input collection. You might be provisioning a bunch of web apps, or maybe you're creating some kind of um, route through a uh, front door. Sorry, I did say route, been here long enough now. Um, and then the other example might be, you may need to invoke some third party codes. So for example, you might be working with a, um, a, a PaaS, sorry, a software as a service system like um, Cloudflare. You might be using Cloudflare for something. Uh, you might need to use Cloudflare in your system. So that, that might be through an API call, maybe through an SDK or something else. And all of these get a bit more complicated when we start looking at the current kind of templating approaches. So let's have a quick look at some <clears throat> conditional logic in ARM and we'll do the same in Terraform. And we'll just hopefully, as we go through, the really the point I'm trying to make here is this stuff starts getting complicated quite quickly. And um, yeah, so here what we're doing is we're creating a website and we only want to provision this website if, if this is in, in production. So we're taking some parameters from the, the input. And then if the parameter equals yes, then we are essentially going to provision this resource. But the key thing to look at here is again, there's now this syntax. There's one, two, three, you know, there's four, there's two sets of braces there. There's <clears throat> there's a function. If you don't work with ARM regularly you're gonna to need to remember this, or you're gonna to have to come back and check the docs again. And again, this is a reasonably simple example, but it starts getting complicated. Um, and it's not super intuitive, right? Condition. Um, look at the same example now in Terraform. And Terraform uses a, a count property and a ternary expression. So my, my kind of developer bias is showing up here. I find this more readable, but uh, it's a ternary expression. And therefore, if is prod is true, then the count is one, otherwise it's zero. The zero count, Terraform, one provision. Where this really starts becoming problematic is things like loops. So here, what we're trying to do is, this is now ARM template again, and we're trying to uh, loop through a collection of uh, parameters and create um, a number of websites. And Really, when you start looking at this, so what we're doing here is we're taking the name, we're doing a concat of a of my app, 
dash, and then we're essentially trying to index into that array um, with this copy index function, whatever that does. Um, and then we've got this copy block and that's uh, using the length of the array as the number of uh, iterations, if you like, of this resource. Um, it's just like, and this is really simple, right? This is just, there's just two properties we're looking at, two strings. What if I wanted to take a number of different properties? If I wanted a, uh, an object instead of a simple array of strings or um, come back to this code in, in a few months time and you'd be struggling to understand what you've, what you've written. Um, yeah, so I'm just, just keeping an eye on the ch chat. So um, Real Robert Aktev says, if if we have to start fresh, we'll go with bicep given as your only else, plumy if multi-cloud is the plan. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Certainly, I think right now, if you're going to start, bicep is, is a bit of an no brainer versus arm. Um, I still think plumy has significant advantage or advantages of a bicep. And we'll we'll get onto that when we talk a bit more about Plumi. So we'll see. Um, <clears throat> just for completeness, let's have a look at Terraform example of this. So here we've got an, an array, and we're, the count is the length of the array, and the name is now the index into the array based on the current count. Again, I find this more readable, but you know, I guess that 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 could be down to personal preference as well. And it was stuff like this that originally led me to, when I was working on a on a thing for a customer at the time, uh, Terraform, I started looking at Terraform because I found, I thought Terraform was gonna be more maintainable for them than the ARM templates. They were a small team who didn't do cloud infrastructure themselves. They were a full stack dev team. And I think this is more intuitive for a dev team. Um, and then I discovered, you know, Plumi, but we'll, we'll, you know, jumping ahead a little bit here. So let's, let's uh, think. So, so far I've just talked about um, kind of running stuff directly with in relation to the cloud provider. But as I said, you often need to run other things. You might need to um, call other APIs. And generally speaking in these in this situation, if there isn't a built-in provider for Terraform, and obviously like ARM doesn't really have this thing, you would drop down into running some kind of script. And the problem with that is it, it can be difficult to test that script without you know, running the whole infrastructure template. The script can be difficult to run. Uh, it will generally rely on the tools being available on the machine that's running that script. You know, it's not self-contained. And then you, your team needs to maintain something in another language, which you know may or may not be a problem, but it's Bash or PowerShell, you know, to add to the list of things. And all of these things need to be kept up to date as well. So when you come back to this infrastructure as code um, definition, the word that you know, when I first heard about it was code. And I, when I heard about code, I was thinking, oh, code like I write .NET or no, C sharp code. And what we've seen isn't really that, right? It's basically what we've seen is markup with code, these kind of code programming things shoehorned into them. You know, evidently, you know, after the fact, if you like, they've, they've picked a markup language and then realized we need this slightly more complex scenarios and we're just gonna shoehorn this construct in. And this is really, when we think about code, this is really where a tool like Plumi comes in. So Plumi is a infrastructure as code tool that allows you to use general purpose programming languages to create your infrastructure. <coughs> Excuse me, as soon as I start talking, the cough starts. Plumi is open source, um, supports many platforms um, and it's declarative, there's a bit of a and there's often a bit of a Twitter Twitter thing going on about Plumi being imperative versus declarative. When you see the code, it's easy to think it's a it's an imperative code, but but it's declarative. And I said it's open source. Most of the Plumi um, stuff is open source. There's one component that is part of their commercial offering that isn't open source. Uh, but you can use Plumi entirely for free. Do everything in Plumi without paying a single penny to Plumi. So Plumi supports a number of languages. I suppose runtimes is probably more accurate um, to say here. So you can use uh, JavaScript or type, TypeScript or Node.js, um, .NET Core, so you've got um, .NET Core available. Go, the, these, were the, these were the kind of uh, core platforms. They recently added Java. I think Python's been in there for a while actually as well. And then the industry is YAML. So YAML is kind of a weird one because um, one of the selling points of Plumi was uh, you can use Plumi with Kubernetes and therefore you can use, get rid of the YAML if you're working with Kubernetes and then now they've got a YAML provider. <clears throat> YAML provider is really there for, in some cases you're doing something very, very simple. You might be creating just a storage account on a website 
Um, and you can describe that in really simply in a, in a YAML file, and you don't need some of the extra stuff that comes with a general purpose programming language. So Plumi has a similar model to Terraform in the sense they have these providers. And um, <clears throat> but of history, actually, Plumi, when they first started, they actually leveraged a lot of the Terraform providers. Um, some of the some of these providers are still Terraform-based providers. So Terraform providers are open source, so Plumi, you know, some would say very cheekily, um, essentially use their providers in their in their own system as well. Um, so this I've, I I took this I updated screenshot this morning. So there's 110 packages. So it's certainly nowhere near, nowhere near uh, the extent that say Terraform has, but um, there's a decent set here. And actually, from my perspective, when I'm now evaluating tools to use in our in our platform, um, whether they support Plumi is actually one of the factors we look at now because this is becoming so key to the way we work. <clears throat> so you can see you've got the most of the cloud providers and just a bit of kind of historical context, you'll see this concept of a native provider and a classic. So when you see classic, that generally means this is a provider that's built on top of uh, the Terraform provider. And then native is, is a provider that's been created by Pulumi uh, natively. One of the interesting things with their native providers is they code gen this directly from the API. It generally tends to track very, very closely with the release of a new feature. So I think when um, Azure Container Apps came out, God, it's probably been a year now, more than a year now, um, Plumi supported that the same day. So it was available immediately. So, so that challenge of having that lag isn't there when it's a native provider, um, which can be really handy. <clears throat> One of the issues with the native providers though is because there are a lot of code gen, some of the documentation for the APIs maybe isn't, isn't as great as, as the handcrafted stuff that's been in the Terraform provider. Apologies if you can hear the police siren in the background. Um, this is Auckland on, on, a, on a morning. So how do you get started with Plumi? So Plumi uses a CLI tool. Um, and what you can do is you can get Plumi to essentially bootstrap a, a, a new project for you. So here I'm, I'm asking Plumi to create me a new Azure C Sharp project. And then he asks me to pick some, some values. So Plumi has a concept of a project and a project is essentially a group of uh, resources that you're gonna deploy. And then they have this concept of a stack. You'll see a concept of a stack mentioned here. So my stack is dev. A stack is, <clears throat> is an environment, if you like. So generally speaking, that will be the same set of resources, but deployed with a different configuration. So your classic one would be your dev test QA prod, for example. So each of those dev test QA would be a different stack because you might have different configurations but essentially it's the same set of resources that are being deployed. <clears throat> so once I've run that um, Plumi command, what, what Plumi has done is essentially created a .NET project for me. Now these, the next few kind of little embedded recordings are a little bit old. So they're gonna reference things like .NET Core 3.1, but as we'll go into real demo, you'll see there's, well, I'm, I'm using .NET Core 6 at the moment now. So if I open up this project that Plumi created for me, what we'll see is this is a, basically just a standard .NET project. Right? If you jump over to the CS Proj, we can see this is a .NET Core 3.1 console application. Um, and it's got a NuGet package reference. Again, these some of these references are a little bit out, out of date now, but, but essentially um, what we're looking at is, is still the same. So we jump across to the actual code. So here's the Plumi code now for creating a storage account and a resource group and a storage account. <clears throat> the key thing now is this is C sharp code. This is not some markup language. You're using your IDE here. So we're creating a resource group and we're creating a variable now. We've got a got a .NET variable. And then when I need to reference a property from that variable, I can do that. So here I'm taking the resource group name, I'm dotting into that variable. I'm you know running this in VS code. I'll get squigglies, I'll get compilation errors, I get you know de developer time experience that I would expect from from any other piece of code that I write. Um, so once I've once I've got that code, and that's the that's the kind of default example that that the Plumi uh, bootstraps for you. Um, how do I create the resources? Um, so in the, at dev time, um, probably the easiest way to get started is you sign into the Azure CLI yourself. You you may need to set a couple of um, environment variables, but then you can use the Plumi CLI to essentially run Plumi up. Um, and what that will do is it will build your code and then it will um, 
start provisioning. So I've skipped a step here. You would generally run Plumi preview, um, which will tell you what it's going to do. But here, it, it also essentially does that as well. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit yes, and it's essentially going to take take that code I've written. Um, so what's happening behind the scenes here is um, Plumi is taking my C-sharp code. It's turning that into a resource graph, and then it's essentially issuing CRUD operations to the cloud provider, to, to Azure, to provision their resources. And it's tracking this, the provisioning of those resources and maintaining that in, in Plumi's got a concept of state very similar to Terraform does. If you use the Plumi service or if that's kind of managed for you, but you can opt out of that and manage it all yourself as well if you want. And that's what you kind of need to do if you want to be completely free. <clears throat> so you can see that was real time that, that I didn't skip anything in the recording. So that took 33 seconds and we've got a storage account um, and a, a, res a resource group and a storage account created. And I also got this link, which I'll come back to in, in a bit. Uh, I can also get Plumi to spit out values I need from my stack. So here I've asked it to give me the connection string details. Um, so that's great for creating a new resource. What about if I want to make a change here? So let's come back to the code. And now what we want to do is add some tags. And what we'll see here is I'm getting IntelliSense. So no, I'm not having to guess what the value should be. And I can add in some, some tags. So these are just key value pairs that you add to a resource. So once I've done that, <clears throat> I can now run Plumi up again. And now Plumi, because it's tracking the state, it's now gonna just modify. It's gonna just tell me, here's the only changes I'm gonna make to your state. So again, it's gonna build that code. And um, very shortly, it will show us the difference that it's gonna make to the, to the configuration. So the key thing here is you can see it's one to update. And then we can drill in a little bit deeper. So we can say, I want to see the details of this. And then you can drill into the details and you can see specifically there that it's gonna, it's gonna add, add these tags. So it's not gonna touch the rest of the storage account. Um, and then this change should be very quick because it's just adding, adding tags in an existing account. Um, now this is running against cloud provider. So in the past people have asked me, oh, you know, is it faster or slower than ARM? The reality is there's no real comparison because um, Sure, you know, whenever you're dealing with a with a cloud provider's API, um, it's not very deterministic. The same thing could be very quick, or it could be quite slow. But you can see that took 11 seconds and it's now been updated. Um, so let's let's have a look in the portal for what this looks like. Um, so here we are. And the first thing you notice here is the the names of these resources. They've got um no way in my code did I have this kind of 5e6 d44. So the default in Plumi is if you if you um, if you leave it as a default, it will essentially add these random characters to the random yeah random characters to the end of your resource group name resource names, and it does this to minimize the risk of naming collisions. Um, now that can be a challenge sometimes if you've got naming schemes within your organization, you can override this behavior, but it's intended to be like this so that you can run. You can run this code lots of times in lots of different stacks, and you don't have to worry about naming collisions. Um, so yeah, so that the, so that's that's the resource that's created. Now, if I'm finished with this and I don't want this anymore, um, and what I will do at the end of this talk, for example, is to run Plumi destroy. So that's essentially going to do as you can imagine, just destroy that that uh, storage account resource group. Now you need to be a little bit careful here. So because we've created the resource group through Plumi. Plumi will delete the resource group. So if you've gone and added stuff to the resource group manually through the portal, Plumi doesn't know about that because it's not in Plumi stack. Plumi is just going to say, I'm going to delete the resource group. And of course, if you tell Azure to delete a resource group, it deletes everything that's in the resource group. So um, you do have to have a think about how you manage these. We'll talk about how we adopt Plumi and how Plumi can coexist with other resources a bit later as well. So that's it, that's that's now gone. Um, now, one thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is you can see every time I've run a PlumiCon, there's been this permalink, this link here. So if we have a look at that, this is now the Plumi console. So this is the this is a bit that you would you know <clears throat> pay for if you like. So this is the Plumi console. And here, what we can do is we can see details of our project and our stack in particular. And key thing really is we can see what, um, configuration we've been using and also what changes we made to our infrastructure. 
through Pulumi. And this is really nice if you're if you're on a small team and you want to track what's been going on, then you can see all of the details are now here tracked in in, in Pulumi console. And um, it can also link to, I don't think it shows it in this one, but it shows you links to the specific Git, um, Git commits that you might be using, which we'll we'll talk about the Git workflow a bit, a bit later as well. <clears throat> so this is the this is the paid for portion of Plumi, although there's a free tier here as well. And I'll talk about the pricing a bit later as well. So wh where is Plumi um, really helpful? If your if your team is working with .NET and you know you've got a reasonably uh, big team of developers, then they're likely to be more comfortable using .NET for the infrastructure um, versus having to learn yet another language, especially something you don't use regularly. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, developers tend to be a little bit more cautious about making changes, worried about breaking something. You can get a bit more confidence if you're using .NET. Um, I guess the assumption here is, and, and certainly my personal philosophy is that we want our development teams to, to own their infrastructure as much as they can as well. We want them to, to manage the full stack, if you like, not just have uh, chuck the infrastructure stuff over to another team. Um, <clears throat> you're using tools and workflows that are familiar to you. So using VS Code or Visual Studio or Rider, um, using GitHub, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then that console gives you a really nice view of seeing what's happening in your in your kind of infrastructure. If you've removed the ability of anybody to make changes to infrastructure directly, so that nobody has the ability to modify the resources in the platform. Um, through the portal, for example, or the CLI, then you know that what you're seeing in that console is the reality. Um, and you get an audit trail of, of what's been going on with your, with your code. We touched on the problems of third-party APIs before. The nice thing with Plumi now is because we're writing C-sharp code, we can call these third-party APIs using either kind of raw C-sharp HTTP calls, if you like, or SDKs. And you can pass values and things from Plumi into these, these things. They, they can coexist. So Plumi, first thing I would generally do is look for a provider. If they don't have a provider, hopefully they've got an SDK. You can use the SDK. The nice thing is you're not dropping down to a scripting language at this point. You are using, again, languages and tools you're familiar with to invoke third-party APIs. Um, we're going to do a, we'll talk about demo a bit later where we are going to use Cloudflare. and one of the issues with one of these demos is it can potentially fail because of DNS. It's always DNS, right? And um, one thing I was looking at this morning was I realized that when you do D C name binding in, in Azure, um, it validates whether that C name is available. And that must be some API call available somewhere. And it turns out there is a REST API call that checks that C name is available. So what I could do is update my demo, which I won't. I didn't want to do this morning to <clears throat> validate that the C name, that Azure has seen the C name change before it tries to bind custom domain. So jumping ahead a little bit here, we'll talk about that when we get into it. Um, so I talked about the developer workflow. So one of the things that we are doing now is we have our Plumi code is in, a, is in a repo. And when somebody wants to make a change, we use the Plumi GitHub action. And we see in the pull request, we see the diff, we see the Plumi preview. Plumi will say, here's what I'm going to change in your infrastructure as a result of this um, pull request. <clears throat> and then, you know, as a reviewer, you're looking at, is this the right change? Is this going to be destructive? Um, and there's lots of, you know, little knobs and things you can tweak around that, which we won't get into. But yeah, it's really powerful versus just running an ARM template. Um, and ARM has this concept of a what if, but in my experience, the what if has been pretty much useless. Um, almost every time I've used the what if to run a known change in, in, a, in an ARM template, it hasn't shown me that, that change is going to be made or not. So. <clears throat> so what about existing resources? You've probably got a bunch of resources already. So in Aura, we have a, you know, like I said, quite a large SaaS platform. Um, and most of that was provisioned through ARM templates and we have ARM templates. So the nice thing with Plume is it can be quite flexible in how you work with it. So what you can do is you can coexist 
your new stuff, you can start using Plumi provision and new stuff and it just coexists with your existing stuff. The only caveat there is what I mentioned, the resource group. I wouldn't use the resource group. You know, I would have a pre-existing resource group, um, but you could do that. Uh, you can adopt existing resources. So the concept here really is you write the you write the, the code for a uh, an existing web app, and then you can tell Plumi that this this code here represents this existing web app. So don't don't create it when you run Plumi up. You're just going to adopt it. It's this it's this existing one here, and that can be a really nice way of slowly slowly adapting adopting existing resources into Plumi. Um, if you opt to kind of start from a clean slate, um, but you have a bunch of existing templates or existing resources, you can also use Plumi to generate the code for you. Now, generating code from existing resources is always a bit, you know, can it, it sounds like a great idea. In in reality, it often will will spit out the the lowest common denominator code. It, it's probably not the code that you'd want to ultimately have, but it could be a good starting point. Um, and now this is part of the Plumi CLI. So you can run Plumi import, give it a, a, a unique resource identifier to a particular resource, and it will spit out the, the code in the language of your choice for that resource. And then that's how you can kind of start building out your, your Plumi code, if you like, as well. Um, they've also got like a, some stuff online where you can take an existing ARM template, paste it in, and, and it will spit out the Plumi equivalent. And you can pick the different options. You can pick the C-sharp one if you want, or the, um, the YAML one if you want, for example. And again, it it, it works, but it, it can be a little bit. Um, like we've got quite complex nested linked templates, and it doesn't work as well on that. But it can be a good place to just grab chunks of code. Um, my experience when we started doing this, it's actually quite quick to, to build it out. There's often run to a few edge cases, but actually it can be quite quick. Um, so far, what we saw and what, what I've been doing is using the Plumi CLI. So I've been writing the code and then jumping into the command line and running the Plumi commands. And obviously, you can run that through automation as well. Plumi has this concept of automation API. <clears throat> this is quite a powerful concept because it, what it allows you to do is to use Plumi from within your own code. So you can now potentially build your own portal. So if you want to have a very limited scope, you maybe want your development team to be able to clone a an environment by pressing a single button, then you can create your own, you can write your own code, essentially your own portal, and you can give them a very limited, a very scoped um, set of resources they can provision by essentially just pretty, pressing a button on a portal. Um, and this can this is quite powerful. And I think we may end up using this as a way of abstracting some of the underlying details away from our development team who don't need to necessarily interact with some of the lower level details. Of the infrastructure. Cool. I'm conscious of time, so let's uh, I, let's kind of dive across and see some some real stuff rather than just pre-recorded videos. So let me let me jump across to um, VS Code. And uh, what I've done is actually what I'll do is let me start running this now. So I've aliased uh, Plumi to P on my on my console just because I'm lazy. So let me just run. Actually, I'm going to do that and I'm going to I'm going to skip the preview because I've run this so many times before. I wouldn't generally recommend you do this. Um, so while that's running, let's have a quick look. So now this is a slightly updated version. So now we can see this is .NET 6 console app. And it's got a couple of uh, new get packages. In particular, you can see this is now an Azure native provider. <clears throat> Jump into the code, and this code is a bit gratuitous. It's it, there's a lot of stuff in here that is not necessary. Fundamentally, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy a uh, storage account, a static HTML page to it, and serve it through um, app service. So we've got a resource group, we've got a storage account, um, got an app service plan, got a blob container. Uh, really, what, what the kinds of things I'm trying to show you here is you know we've got got direct references, I'm getting IntelliSense, I'm getting, you know, I can pick these values, um, getting squigglies if I don't compile. If you've used ARM templates, if you manage to run an ARM template first time after creating it and it's worked the first time, you're either a genius or a liar. So, um, and just to kind of show you some other things. Uh, so for example here, 
I'm creating a SQL server. It's completely unnecessary, but I kind of just wanted to show you how different bits stitch together. So here I've got a, when you create a SQL server, you need to give an admin password. I don't care about the admin password. So I'm using a, one of the Plumi packages that can generate a random password for me. So it's going to generate a random password. I've no idea what the password is. I don't care. Um, when I do this for real, we use AD based SQL admins. Uh, you still need the password. Or certainly you did for until recently, at least, you, you still need to provide the password. Um, and then we're creating a database here. And you can see we're taking values from the SQL Server name. I come into the web app, and as I said, this is kind of where things get interesting. So uh, I've got App Insights here, and I need the App Insights. I need to set a uh, config value for the App Insights key. Now, you notice that those names of those resources were not deterministic, right? I can add those random characters at the end. So how do I get the values of all of those things? Um, well, Plumi has this concept of uh, output of string. You can see on the screen there at the moment, and there's also an input of string. This essentially is like a promise. So what Plumi is doing is it doesn't know the value of that particular resource's name because it hasn't been created yet. So it will use this output string and input string to reference the value, and it will essentially plug in the value when it becomes available, when this resource is being created. And that's what this function is doing here. So this apply function is essentially taking the value of the key when it becomes available, and then it's going to put into the string interpolation. Um, so that's how I get the value, even though I might not know the name of the, I don't know the value of that key at the time. And this example is probably <clears throat> most visible, this, this comes from most visible here. This code does look a little bit complicated, but essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the SQL Server name, the database name, and the password, and we're building a connection string. So we're, we're creating this uh, connection string, and the values of these are determined when this resource is provisioned. So I don't know beforehand what's happening here. Um, so when this finishes, which it's nearly done by the look of it, it will spit out a... Um, a URL, I should get a URL back for the value. <clears throat> Just checking the questions while we're waiting. Um, yeah, it's a language is, I, I think you can use um, C Sharp is, is, the, is obviously the one I'm using. I think you can also use F Sharp, but um, yeah, I think you can, I'm not 100% sure actually. So I'm a bit, bit centric on, uh, on on C sharp. So here we are, that's finished now. So that took about three minutes and uh, spat out um, a link. So what I should be able to do now is, is open that link and that's opened in a totally different window than I wanted. And there we are. So that's created a web app for me from scratch. That name there wasn't predetermined and um, yeah, deployed it for me. In reality here, what we deploying the code around with the infrastructure is something we're still kind of working out how we're, we are, we, we're, we're kind of working out how the flow works. Um, let me let me flip over to uh, GitHub and we'll, we'll have a quick talk about some of the GitHub options. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll do a quick change here. So this is my GitHub page. And uh, what I've got is I've got some actions here for doing, um, a Plumi preview. And we can have a look at an old pull request actually, because I'm conscious we're going to run out of time. In fact, very, very tight on time. So here I did a pull request where I added a storage account. And we can see here that um, as part of that pull request, I got this diff. And it tells me it's going to create a storage account. Sometimes you get this noise where it thinks it's going to change other variables. These things can be a bit variable, um, changeable. Now, what we what I could do is when I merge this pull request, I can get this to be deployed automatically. Um, what I wanted to show you though was a slightly more complicated example where if I come back to my um, VS code, let's switch over to another branch. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have my, um, my website with a custom domain. I don't want it to have um, the random you know, Azure Websites domain. So what I'm doing here is if I jump over to the CS project quickly, I've now added in the Cloudflare uh, package reference. I've got a Cloudflare um, key in my token. 
I haven't touched on this before, but um, Plumi allows you to use secrets in its config files and the secrets get encrypted based on the stack. So um, this is not um, this is not a security issue, if you like, because these, these are these are encrypted. This isn't the actual value. This gets decrypted when Plumi is actually running. You can also choose to use um, your own secrets provider as well, and which is what we do in production, actually. Um, so this is similar code to what I've just shown you. I've ripped out a few things just to make it run a bit quicker. But um, fundamentally, what we're going to do is we're going to set a, a domain verification record in um, Cloudflare based on the app service plan. So we can see we're referencing now values from Azure to pass to Cloudflare. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a new CNAME record based on the name of that, that app. Well, we don't know the name of the app beforehand. Um, and we are, um, because this is using DNS and DNS is always the thing that often goes wrong. Um, I'm kind of being very explicit with these depends on, so this is how I can tell Pulumi that I want it to do things in a particular order. So I'm being really explicit about the fact that I want um, this CNAME to be created after the verification DNS has been created. Um, <clears throat> and then we've got a custom domain and then uh, we're going to set the custom domain on the web app and hopefully give us back the custom domain. Now this, as I said, this can fail because that DNS propagation to Azure may not be may not be super quick. Um, and I think I have now, you know, using the Azure API, I think I can find a way around that. So let's quickly run this. And what we'll do is, um, so I'm going to run this up again. Uh, so I'm going to do skip preview. And what it's going to do now is going to delete some of the things I'm referenced in here, like the database or whatever, but I don't care. But given the time, what I'll do is I'll flip back to the slides. We'll finish off the slides and we'll come back and we'll see if that uh, updates worked. <clears throat> so what are the real pros for Plumi? Um, you're using languages you're already familiar with. So in the past, I my position on this was, look, you know, if you're a small team, this is really quite powerful. My stance on this has changed now. For me now, Plumi is almost a no-brainer. I said, I don't work for Plumi. Um, you know, um, it's purely that, in my opinion, you can do every single thing you can do with ARM or Terraform. As a bare minimum, you can do all of that in Plumi, but you can do so much more. And for me, that just feels like, why wouldn't you? Right? Um, and especially because... Um, there's this trap that we often fall into, which is you could have a development team of 20 people who are all very familiar with .NET, and you might have one or two people who are familiar with um, Terraform or um, ARM or Bicep, um, which is the more constrained resource, right? It's it's usually going to be your development team is you know more more familiar with it. You don't want to build pockets of specialism. You see this a lot with business rules engines, right? It's, it's a classic trap. You're using the power of modern programming languages. You can start doing refactoring. We haven't really touched on it, but you can write unit tests. You can write integration tests um, using XUnit, for example. You're not using some weird, weird and wacky tools here. I think it's really, really easy to get started. And because you can, you can do this incrementally. You can start migrating. Again, it's for me it just makes makes a lot of sense. Um, it's free to use if you choose to you can you can use it entirely for free you don't give Lumi a single single cent single penny um and that that Lumi automation api really opens up a number of other scenarios like i definitely don't recommend you use it to build your own azure portal with all that flexibility but certainly a scoped portal where you're provisioning a bunch of resources <clears throat> the other key thing with that is you're going to create resources which adhere to your own policy so you might have um, you might have policy that says, you know, every SQL server must have auditing turned on, must have transparent encryption, et cetera, et cetera. You can encapsulate that behind these portals if you like. So that every time your team creates a SQL server, they're always going to have these things implemented. And you don't need to use Azure policy to, to try and enforce it or block it, et cetera. They don't do it. So let's talk about pricing quickly. Um, so I've been using the individual tier here. And it's a really good way of getting started. So it's essentially, it's free. You can use it. It's a single user, but you can use it for as many projects as you want. And you know, it's free. You get that portal as part of that, that console as well. When you move to the kind of more commercial tiers, um, 
they they moved to this kind of pricing model of essentially you pay per resource that you manage through Pulumi. So you get like 150,000 credits for free, and then it's fraction of a fraction of a cent per per resource after that. It's not prohibitively expensive. Um, it's I think we got our you know we've been ramping up our uh, our usage, and I think our first bill was like twenty dollars or something. So it's really not not super expensive. Um, if you're managing a huge state of cloud resources, you're going to be paying orders of magnitude more for those resources than you are going to be paying for Plumi. Um, so what are the issues with Plumi? Well, it does, you know, realistically, it does, does support fewer platforms than Terraform does. But again, that only really matters if it doesn't exist. There is also um, the Plumi team are reasonably open to taking an existing Terraform provider and, and converting it to Plumi. And they've also got examples of doing that if you wanted to do it yourself. It's not, it's not trivial, but it's also not, you're not rewriting from scratch. There's a way of essentially adapting the Plumi, sorry, the Terraform provider and turning it into a, a, a Plumi provider. Now, this isn't really a problem with Plumi, but you still need to know the cloud provider's API, right? You still need to know whether you should be using a LRS storage account or a GRS storage account. Those things are not going to go away. And, um, you know, maybe the IntelliSense helps a little bit, but essentially my job is still secure. I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about my, you know, my development team being able to, to use code and, and run their own infrastructure because they'll still need our input for these kinds of things. Based on the API you're using, some of the errors are not necessarily apparent until you run Plumi up. So you might run Plumi preview, everything looks good. You run Plumi up, you get an error. <clears throat> and often that's down to the, the API that's being used doesn't necessarily surface the requirement in, in its uh, open API spec. So it might not say that a parameter is, is required. Turns out it was required. So sometimes when you run Plumi up, you might get an error when everything looks like it's gonna, gonna be good. Um, it's possible to get Plumi in, in a bit of a confused state. So I mentioned that it, it takes the resource graph and it, it starts issuing essentially CRUD commands to the resource provider. If you suddenly kind of kill Plumi midway through that, then the cloud provider is gonna carry on provisioning its resource. It doesn't really care, but Plumi has now lost that connection. Um, so you can get yourself in a bit of a mess, but it's actually reasonably straightforward to fix. And you can tell Plumi to, <clears throat> refresh itself from based on existing state. You can remove pending operations. Um, it's actually a good way of learning some of the nitty gritty details of Plumi by, by essentially fixing it if you break it. And they do warn you about doing some of these things as well. I'm gonna skip through these slides very quickly. Um, every cloud provider has an SDK. Why don't you use an SDK? One of the key things with the SDKs is they are imperative calls to the cloud provider. They It's very hard to reason what your current state is versus the new state from your REST calls. So the key thing with Plumi is when I run that, when I added those tags, it's showing me I already have these resource groups in the storage account and I'm adding just the tags in. If you're doing imperative REST calls, you're essentially just doing a bunch of you know, state changes. You don't necessarily know what the current state is now, what the picture of that is. And some of those calls may not be item potent either. So running them twice could give you two sets of resources. Um, so quickly touch on transpilers. So this is a concept of, um, so cloud providers like AWS introduced something called a CDK. Terraform has recently introduced the CDK. These are essentially uh, writing general purpose programming languages, but often these things spit out the cloud providers kind of native thing at the end. So AWS CDK generates cloud formation templates and then Terraform generates TF files. So they still have some of the limitations of you know, okay, the syntax problem's gone away, but some of the other ecosystem problems are still there. And um, Farm is an F-sharp project that's been around quite a while now. And it, it does some of the things, it generates ARM templates. F-sharp is actually a really powerful language. I, I've, I've never managed to kind of hook onto it, but for uh, infrastructure, F-sharp can be really powerful, a really terse way of creating infrastructure. I promised I'll talk about BICEP. So BICEP is, is the domain-specific language from Microsoft. It kind of makes, uh, essentially makes ARM look like Terraform, if I'm honest. It's a lot to set, a lot, lot easier to work with than, than um, ARM is, but it still has the same limitations in that it's Azure specific only at the moment. And um, and therefore, you know, you're still scoped to only Azure resources. So the way I really think about 
the evolution, if you like, um, is when you start off in your kind of cloud infrastructure journey you're using portals, these templating languages, a significant evolution, you, you step forwards here, you're now using um, infrastructure's code, essentially. Um, for me personally, Terraform is a step forwards from pure ARM because of the multi-cloud options and the Tersa syntax. But really, when you start using general purpose programming languages like Plumi, it feels like to me, honestly, like why weren't we always doing this? Why did we decide to create markup languages? Um, if you want to learn more, Plumi has a ton of examples with lots of different languages, lots of different providers on their GitHub. <clears throat> their Slack has been, in the past I've used their Slack, it's been super helpful. Get general got responses really quickly. Um, I don't know why I've got my link to my blog. I haven't blogged for ages, um, but hopefully I'll get back to doing that. Um, just before we finish up, let's quickly jump back and check whether we uh, succeeded or not. So it looks like how a Plumi up worked. And let me run, click on this link now. Where did that open? Here. And yeah, so there we can see now we've got a uh, custom domain and we've got the thing. There's a bit of smoke and mirrors here because I've got a .dev domain. It has to be served over TLS. Cloudflare is doing the TLS here, by the way, just, just to be transparent. But uh, um, yeah, so even though the, the web app behind this has got an unknown name, I've got a custom domain now. That's right. And that DNS worked this time, but it doesn't always. Cool. Uh, let's just get back to the last slide, really, which is to be honest, is just to say, Thank you very much. Um, Aura is hiring. We are hiring in the UK, but not for engineering roles. But if you know somebody who's interested in customer success, please take a look. Awesome place to work. Um, if you're interested in coming to uh, New Zealand, lots of tech jobs out here. Great way of life. Highly recommend it. Um, getting getting visas and getting residence is becoming e easier and easier um, as well, especially if you're from the UK, because there's such a demand here. Um, that's it. That's it for me. Um, don't know if I missed any questions, but um, I'm happy to stick around and and take a look uh, as well. And sorry, just one other thing. Yeah, if there's any questions that I don't get to on the chat, uh, you're watching this after the fact, uh, feel free to ping me on on any of those two two places. <clears throat>